All right, so here's the trachea right here. Here's the esophagus. And normally the esophagus is actually sitting right behind there, right? So if you remember, the, if you've seen the cartoon image, then you can kind of visualize that better. So the, again, the, the, car, the esophagus is sitting right behind here. This, if you remembered anything from way back, Mm -hmm. about cartilage right here that's your hyaline cartilage ring right so that's holding your that's holding the big your big windpipe open right so this you know while the esophagus is a collapsible muscular tube that will open and close based on whether you're you know peristalsis and food going down it this is kept open by this cartilage ring right here it's a c ring it doesn't go all the way around and on the back here you've got <clears throat> Uh, a bunch of connective tissue, if you're able to recognize that. You've got glands, right, because the esophagus, you have the mucous membrane. And then the tracheolus muscle, whoops, is smooth muscle. And you can hopefully, you know, after working with the digestive system, maybe at this point, you'll be able to recognize the difference between this tissue and this tissue right here. So that's your tracheolus muscle tissue right there. And then the other part, is the cartilage. And a lot of the epithelial lining is, has been like just taken away just due to the prep, but you can see there's still a couple of areas where you can see that pseudostratified columnar epithelium, right? Mm -hmm. So that's one slice. That's the trachea and esophagus slide. And then the other is your, is this slice right here. I just, I'm just showing this to show you what you're looking at when you're looking at those histology slides that look like this, right? So what you're looking at, here's the actual lung, right? These are all the branches getting smaller and smaller until they lead to those alveolar sacs and alveolar ducts right there. So here's a magnification of a small section of lung. Any kind of section that you take in a lung is going to have all sorts of, you're going to have trach, you're going to have different size bronchi uh, and bronchioles, as well as the alveoli all around right there, right? So here is the bron terminal bronchiole going into your alveolar sacs, and then this is a close-up of those alveolar sacs. So what you're looking at when you're looking at one of these sections right here is you might see a space, you know, this is a really nice clean version of what this is. It's not always that, it's, it's hardly ever that obvious what you're actually looking at, but that's what these represent right here, right? these alveolar ducts, and then each one of these spaces is that alveolar space right within here. And usually what it actually is, is um, capillaries that are surrounding those, what you're looking at, because there's all sorts of blood vessels, of course, going through that as well. So what you want to be able to recognize is the larger uh, respiratory tubes, the bronchi, that are going to have cartilage rings mm -hmm. surrounding those tubes. Right, so here is a bronchi, and you could just click on them. Here's number one. Here's number two. See the cartilage. Here's number three. See the cartilage, right? And of course, mm -hmm. it's not going to look perfect. And remember that the cartilage rings turn into like these cartilage plates that are surrounding them. And again, they're keeping the airways open. And so that's the larger ones, and you could still see the pseudostratified. And then when you get to your bronchioles, you'll see part of that respiratory tract that's not, that doesn't have the cartilage around it. You'll see smooth muscle, connective tissue and all that stuff. But for you, just recognize it as a bronchiole, right? And then all these, and I won't ask you to identify the difference between a sac and an alveoli itself or a duct or anything, but that's what all these are, these alveoli. Okay. And it's multiple choice. I'm not going to confuse you on anything. You can, if you look at this for, I don't know, 20 minutes, you'll, you'll have it down. And then the second slice is, I believe all I put is this one, the muscular artery and medium vein within the <clears throat> mesentery. I remember all those, those uh, serous membranes and they had all the blood vessels running through them. This is a good section because you got so much stuff in here. It's also confusing because of that. But these two big things right here, you got a major, uh, you got a medium size artery right here, and you got a medium size vein right here. And then these are, these are the biggest ones in here. And in here, it's very obvious, right? This is 
This has a lot of structure. This is pretty floppy right here. And it's even more clear, again, when you go to those sections that are stained, that elastin is stained for, because we could really see the distinct layers, right? In this case, in this case, the elastin is stained black. So you got that inner mm -hmm. elastic membrane really prominently on the arteries. You have an outer elastic membrane also. And then this big thick layer of the tunica media, right? The smooth muscle. Also, those squiggly little black lines right there are the elastic fibers within them, right? And then your elastic connective tissue, right? That dense, irregular with a lot of elastic fibers is surrounding the outside right there. The veins, even the big ones, the structure of them, there's not as much as elastic fibers. They do have like a very thin elastic membrane around it, right? And But the, the layers aren't, nearly as nice and neat as the other ones. You could look at, at this slice if you want. You could kind of get an idea uh, a little more about those layers with this because the collagen is staying blue. Right there. All right, so those are the big ones. But you could also look at any group. You know, if you could just scroll around this page Right. If you find a group of vessels, these are all vessels. This is all adipose tissue on the outside mm -hmm. right here. But you got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven vessels, probably some more smaller ones right here. And these at, at very smallest, it's hard to tell, right? But how many arteries do you see in this picture right off the bat? Uh would there be five of them? Yeah, exactly. Right, and you're you're seeing you're you're looking at those those thick inner uh -huh. elastic membrane is what is giving it away right there, for the most part. Right, without that, these are really hard to tell. Right, so within all these, these are the arteries. So you know, size for size, it would be hard to tell without those. You could tell that by looking at the other ones. Okay. So that's basically what you want to do for the histology. It's not that much, just takes a little bit of work. Uh, no, really, really no more than what we just went over right there. Last time we left off, we went from those big conducting arteries, uh, you know, that were elastic, that were sort of uh, mediating the pressure, right? They were kind of dampening that big pulsations coming from the heart. They were leading to muscular arteries that were kind of controlling the blood flow through that uh, smooth muscle layer the tunica media, and then they branched off into smaller and smaller ones until you get to your arterioli, right? And then we talked about those in context of being able to control flow of blood into a given capillary bed by these precapillary stents right there, right? So if you want to increase blood flow there, you'd loosen these up, right? So that blood flow would be flowing through this capillary bed or you could tighten these up, right? So these are kind of like acting like valves as blood flow through these capillary beds. And then when you get to the very smallest arterioles, like they're called meta, meta arterioles, they're kind of like a hybrid between arterioles <laughs> and capillaries, right? But today we're really, this is like an abstract picture of these capillary beds. And that's what we're going to kind of talk about today. And then we'll also talk about as the blood leaves the capillary beds and going back up to the heart, uh, what happens there with those veins, hopefully. Or maybe I'll shut up, I don't know. So when you're talking about these capillaries, these are the very, very smallest ones, right? They're just like completely, you know, enveloping all the tissues of your body. That's what's going, that the, the size and the amount of them are, are pretty hard to grasp there. But like, this is an electron mitograph. This is a single, red blood cell packed inside one of these vessels, right? So mm -hmm. super, super small. These are like five microns, which is, I don't know, like one, two hundredths of a millimeter, which is about, I don't know, the size of a pin or two or something, right? So very, very small, right? Very, very small stuff going through these capillaries. So here's a, here's a picture from that slice I just gave you. Here's like a medium sized vein. This is about I don't know, like a millimeter across, again, the size of a, 
a pin a, a head pin or something like that. I don't know. It's small. How about that? This itself is very small. You can almost see it visibly, but within that uh, medium sm uh, or smaller vein right here, you've got all those blood vessels, which are about each one is usually about five microns, I think, for a single blood cell. Don't quote me on that. But the bottom line is, imagine the, if this one is about the head of a pin, more or less, this is how many of these, the capillaries, which are about the width of one of these blood cells, how many of those can fit in, right? Just to give you an idea of the size right there, of the scale we're looking at. So here's another side view. And right here, there's the red blood cells, like slowly being passed through in a file through these capillaries right here. So this, the purple, is the endothelial cell nucleus. That's the simple squamous cells that make up uh, these capillaries. And that's pretty much what they consist of, right? They, they have a very small basement membrane. If anybody, that's the whole, the extent of their layers, right? They've lost the tunica media, uh, the tunica at the adventitia, right? So it's just basically a single cell layer going through there. Right. So we've already kind of discussed this, you know, in briefly, actually we've talked about this a lot, right? The last thing we talked about <clears throat> was that blood flow around the capillary networks surrounding all your alveoli, right? Blood coming in, oxygen deficient blood coming in, oxygen diffusing in at the arterial end, carbon dioxide flowing out, right? And this is all based on concentration gradients around the lung right there. So comes in oxygen starved, leaves oxygen rich, these capillaries. And that's all because very thin walls between the alveoli and the pulmonary capillary. So that was your, <clears throat> that was your lungs, right? Again, the levels of oxygen and carbon dioxide are really gonna drive that diffusion rates. Oxygen's gonna diffuse in, carbon dioxide is gonna diffuse out. And that's all because they can do that pretty rapidly, especially compared to the fact that the blood is flowing through at a certain rate that is optimal for that uh, gas exchange right there. So that's what's happening and what we've already discussed. And then, you know, more about the systemic circuit. You got oxygen rich being pushed in through the arterial end and then diffusing out into the body tissues uh, based again on concentration gradients and then carbon dioxide uh, diffusing in, right? Uh, <clears throat> diffusing into the blood vessel so the blood is leaving oxygen poor, carbon dioxide rich. And that's gas exchange, right? That simple squamous epithelial right here is gonna, that's easy to accommodate for gas, right? Gas just diffuses through that, but that's pretty much the only thing that's going right through the membranes, right? So just pay attention to that for a second, right? So when you look, this is an electron micrograph uh, of the cell membrane right here. You got these little penocytotic vesicles, little uh, vesicles which form, these can transport stuff from one side of the capillary into the tissue. And, but for the most part, there's these either pores or intercellular clefts, that is little breaches in between the epithelial lining that's gonna allow larger molecules, glucose, you know, basically fluid, which has dissolved uh, nutrients or whatever you want diffusing into that area, right? So it's, it's certainly not big enough. A, a blood cell, you know, would be encompassing this whole thing is not getting out these pores, but smaller stuff is getting through these pores through those capillaries. So big picture, arterial blood coming in here, flowing in through here. It's going to flow through these capillary beds right here. And fluid, the filtered fluid is going to filter out right at the arterial end moving into the interstitial space, which I'll talk about in a second. And then it's gonna be drawn in on the venous side, right, for to be carried, this stuff to be carried away through the venules system, right? And that's the big picture. Hopefully I'll have enough time to little talk about the lymphatic system as well, which is related to all this. So for that interstitial fluid, this is really actually an important part that you know, people kind of conceptually leave out, right? When you're looking at something like this, it's just a bunch of nothing around it, right? It's just diffusing out into air. In reality, 
when we go back to all your lectures, everything, remember all that connective tissue, all that loose connective tissue, uh, the areolar tissue, and the ground substance. The ground substance was that watery fluid, really, which is what the basis of this interstitial fluid is in most of your tissue, right? So surrounding all your, the tissues and cells of your body, you got all that uh, loose connective tissue, there's some kind of ground substance that stuff can diffuse through, right? So from your capillaries to the tissues, it's always going to need some kind of aqueous medium, right? Of some sort going through that. So it's really the last sort of part of the whole circulatory system is this interstitial fluid or first part, depending on what, you know, which end you're looking at, right? So stuff is going to diffuse out you know, either gas through the membranes or through these pores or intracellular clefts into the diffuse, uh, surrounding interstitial fluid. And then stuff migrates, right, to and from these capillaries to the tissues or to the capillaries and vice versa. Right. Are there any questions on that whole idea? Like when you're looking at something like this, just try to remember to put it in some kind of context, right? So when we talked about the skin, right, um, we, that was one of the, well, we talked about the bones too, but when we talked about the skin, we talked about those networks of capillaries right underneath the epithelial lining, which was avascular, right? So they wouldn't have blood, but that loose connective tissue was going to provide the sort of medium for stuff to diffuse out of these capillaries right near the surface, as well as throughout the whole, you know, the dermis and the epidermis, right? So you had all that media. We got to muscles, those, uh, <clears throat> muscle cells, those long fibers right there, they had that uh, endomesium lining each muscle cell. You had the vessels right here going in between them, right? So stuff was diffusing out around those cells right there, getting into the tissues behind there. We talked about the brain, right? the capillaries, right? Going through those choroid plexuses where stuff was diffusing out of the capillaries. It was taken up by those epidemal cells and made into cerebral, sp cerebral spinal fluid or the blood brain barrier capillaries going through the brain stuff being kind of more tightly controlled through that blood brain barrier mechanisms. Right. But again, capillaries coming in, uh, bringing nutrients and stuff in and, you know, uh, putting waste out right there. All right. Also, let's just keep going here. All right. More capillaries in those villi of the small intestine. You had arterioles feeding these uh, capillaries within the villi. Right, bringing blood in, but in this case, you know, the main function here was to pick up nutrients and stuff dissolved by your digestive system, bring them in through here. And again, this would be your lamina propria, loose connective tissue stuff. That's uh, the, it was diffusing into these capillaries right here, bringing it back into the system. And more recently, in your lungs, again, those capillary beds surrounding all your alveoli, right? Bring in in this case, bringing deoxygenated blood in, picking up oxygen, and then bringing oxygenated blood out through those pulmonary veins. And more recently, I mentioned that the bigger blood vessels, right, uh, that, you know, most the smaller blood vessels can actually get their oxygen and nutrients to right through the blood itself. You know, there's mechanisms to get outside, but for bigger blood vessels, you had that whole uh, network of vessels and capillaries called a vasa vasorum vessel of the vessels that were supplying the larger blood vessels. All right, so everybody get the general idea. When you look at cartoons like this, here's a bunch of undifferentiated sort of generic cells, right? But this is your body tissue, all those things I just mentioned right there. So it does help in your own mind to have something concrete, whether it's your biceps, brachii, your heart, your lungs, whatever, whatever you want to think of, try to think of something concrete. Uh, and, but this is a nice, you know, you want to sort of isolate it and think of it in simplistic terms. So here are the cells, uh, the cells of the tissues of the body, interstitial fluid, and then here's a capillary going in. So once again, blood flow being kind of pushed in through the arterial end uh, of the capillary bed. And Blood is going to be moving slowly through, being pushed in, and this is going to allow for diffusion of materials, right? Leaving the blood vessels, right? And it's going to be, there's going to be a little bit of pressure pushing it through right here. So, but your net fluid movement, 
is going to be out, right? Because the pressure here inside the vessel is going to be higher than the pressure outside the vessel. As you move through that capillary bed, right, the fluid, everything will decrease, the ions will decrease in there. So all of a sudden the pressure out within the tissue is gonna become greater and there's gonna be a net movement inside the capillaries, right? So it's gonna be all pressure-based differences for the most part, right? <clears throat> so fluid is pushed out of the vessels at the arterial end because of the increased blood pressure and then fluid is gonna be drawn in at the venule end of these capillaries. Is there any questions on, on this whole process right here? And one thing, I'm just gonna mention this and confuse you further that, you know, this is the simple idea, but imagine if this was your biceps brachii right here and our, you know, this was the proximal end, this was the distal end. When you look at a picture like this, you think that the proximal end is getting all the oxygen and the distal end is getting, you know, just getting stuff taken away. But of course, the way these capillaries are organized, you know, the whole tissue is gonna be equally served, right? Like this, okay? It's just complicates pictures, so they, they make a nice proximal distal sort of picture of that. Okay, so as stuff is moving through here, right, this is showing stuff going out these little intercellular clefts, these little holes in the capillary of some sort, right? So the bigger molecules, rather than just the gas going through the membranes can get through. There's a couple of different types of capillaries, right, that will allow more or less stuff to get through those vessels depending on the organ's needs or depending on the function of that organ. Okay, so I'm just gonna go over these different types of capillaries very quickly. All right, so here's a, what's most of your tissues, most of the stuff we talk about, like your muscles, your coronary circulation, most of the normal circulation in your body has our, what are called these continuous capillaries and you will have some intercellular cliffs. You may or may not have these pinocytotic vesicles, that is stuff that uh, are gonna move through the uh, membrane wall through these pinocytic vesicles, right, onto the outside. And you'll have a relatively uh, constant basement membrane, right? But the cells themselves, uh, for the most part, will be covered by these tight junctions, right? And so the control, the stuff coming out of here is sort of the least permeable for as, as far as what the capillaries will run into your body. And it's the most common. Right. So here, glucose, proteins, amino acid, anything normal tissue needs, stuff is getting out through these uh, mechanisms right there. So these are continuous capillaries. Other types, and these occur in particular areas, right, where you're going to have active either absorption, like in your small intestine, or it's gonna serve a filtration purpose, as we'll see when we get to the kidneys. Right, in this case, they'll have these uh, multiple, many fenestrations or pores. And basically it looks like capillaries that, uh, like with a shotgun blast through it, right? You got all these holes within the membranes and <clears throat> histologically, they're hard to tell from the intercellular clefts. I, I can't tell them myself, but there they are, there are these holes and these are called fenestrated capillaries. So when we talked about the uh, villi of the small intestine stuff, the nutrients get in through here, these capillaries are generally fenestrated to allow all those absorbed nutrients into the capillaries faster. When we get to the kidneys, we'll talk about the uh, uh, filtering of blood, right? Blood's gonna be coming in through this space right here, and there'll be these capillaries in here that are fenestrated, right? So in this case, not that blood is being filtered, but the filtrate is allowing bigger things to go into this capsular space, which will be uh, processed for filtration, either uh, re reabsorbed by the body or peed out, okay? So those are fenestrations. That's a good sort of cartoon picture of what fenestration means, pores. Right? And then your last type is the sinusoidal capillaries. Right here. And these are the most permeable. These, when you need a lot of exchange uh, between the capillaries and the tissues right here. And these will be cells that are doing, I mean, tissues, sorry, that are doing uh, work on that blood, right? So there's the liver, there's a big filtration mesh in your spleen, 
is doing a lot of filtering of the blood. Your bone marrow is making new blood cells and everything. So blood cells have got to get into large spaces. So all these require very permeable capillaries right here. All right, so when your liver, remember all the digested food is coming on through the hepatic portal vein, going in through the liver, and that blood that's coming in here is gonna go through the hepatic portal vein. Blood's gonna come in, and it's going to spill out of those capillaries so that these cells of the liver can take care of whatever you just ate, right? Making, processing, uh, glucose, food, uh, alcohol, stuff like that, right? And then once those cells are done with it, they'll go back to the hepatic vein, right? So, but these vessels are called, this whole structure is called sinusoids, and these are sinusoidal capillaries. All right, so that's it for capillaries. And I think that's it for capillaries. Uh, you know, this is the sort of continuum from tight, right? Not letting too much stuff out, your normal situation. Whereas in these situations here, fenestrated or sinusoid, uh, these will have a particular function for filtering blood or uh, absorbing nutrients from them.